Uh, anyone knows uh, this movie? But movie critics have rightly claimed that John Wick was a breath of fresh air in the action genre. Anyone not seen this movie? Fair enough, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, The Avenger or something that everyone feel like they have to see. But anyway, I, I, so, so with this movie, I, I told e um around, I think, Thursday or Wednesday that I had something in mind for the sermon that, that, that touches on John Wick. So I proposed to e that I need to study this film for the glory of God, obviously. And e immediately displayed her wisdom with just one simple question. How much of John Wick is going to be in the sermon? And, uh, you know, fear not, it's not, not much. And I mean, it is John Wick. What can you really study in his film? Uh, unless you want to know about underground society and its structure. But nonetheless, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't watched the film, I'm just going to go through a little bit as well. So this is John. John lost his wife over an illness. She was his everything, you know, his light, his hope, his video on the thing, you know, yada yada, we don't really care. And I, ooh, puppy, that's all we care about, a cute little puppy. Knowing she was going to pass away, she arranged for a puppy to be delivered to him so that he can continue to learn to love and see the light for life. And it's just, small puppy. And uh, John pissed off and easily but her rich bad guy, he came over and beat John up and uh, killed the puppy. And it was like, no, not the puppy. And I remember everyone watching there on the internet was like, no, not the puppy. And that was exactly how John felt. Not the puppy. So he went on full revenge mode. Turns out he's like the assassin of assassin in the past. He went after the rich bad dude for what he did. Yes, exactly what he did to his puppy and the rich bad dude's dad got stuck in the mess as well and all these things so john went after them all right the kid kept running away to dad to dad's bar to dad's safe house but there was no running away from the john wick you know the dad tried to strike first but failed time and time again he ended up running but there was no running away from the Baba Yaga. See, I studied my film. More of the story. There's no running away from John Wick. All right? He will come at you in so many ways that you simply can't keep running away from him. And the other more of the story, puppies are innocent. Leave them alone. They're cute. People hate you for killing them. You know, it's not the best plot uh, in terms of movies. Uh, maybe it was a bit too much killing over a puppy, or maybe not, you know. It is hard to not cheer on for John on his revenge tour for this cute puppy. Especially when, I don't even know the puppy's name, or I didn't study the film that hard. Especially when it was killed intentionally and deliberately. But what if, what if the puppy was only accidentally killed? What would have John done? I don't know, but it sounds like a very boring movie, so I don't want to think about it. And so I'm going to turn the Bible to Joshua chapter 20. It says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, it has nothing to do with puppies, by the way. I'm not talking about puppies tonight. Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. So today I want to look at these cities of refuge God gave Israelites to run to. Instead of just listing the situations they can run away from, God highlighted where they can run to. And the simple question is, are we to run from or are we to run to? And let's kind of take that time to also look at our own lives as well. What are you running from? And more importantly, where are you running to? And I just open the space, the Holy Spirit will just invite you to speak to us in this time together. Give us the courage to not run away from, but the courage to always run to you. And I pray that this will um, help you learn something, in fact, about the cities of refuge. So let's go to a quick 
history lesson. All right, God chose Abraham. Uh, history as in biblical history. God chose Abraham. Abraham had a son. The son had twins. One of them had 12 sons. I don't have the budget to engage with ECM on this. And, uh, and the law of reproduction over time says 4 million people in Egypt after 400 years. 4 million is way more than this if you want to you know, like be very critical about my little stick man figure. But and then God chose Moses to lead them out of Egypt. People were ungrateful. There was 40 years spent in the desert. Moses then passed the baton of leadership to Joshua and the new generation. Joshua led them to many victorious battles, and the land was divided among the tribes. And in Numbers it says, command the Israelites to give the Levites, so the Levites were one of the tribes, towns to live in from the inheritance of the Israelites will possess. So this is Moses speaking of what will happen when they divide the land. And give them, the Levites, uh, pasture lands around the towns. Then they will have towns to live in and pasture lands for the cattle they own and all their other animals. So the land were divided among the tribes, but the Levites kind of had, the, had a different deal. And the other, they don't, didn't get a land, and the other tribes were to give some cities uh, that they have in proportion to the land size that were given to them, and they're going to give those to the Levites. And then at Joshua's time, it says the towns of the Levites in the territory held by the Israelites were 48 in all, together with their pasture lands. Each of these towns had pasture lands surrounding it. This was true for all these towns. So what was said by Moses to Joshua, he did it when the time is to do it. 48 cities. And of those cities, six of them had special purposes. In Numbers, when, Paul, when, 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 not Paul, when Moses was dressing it, he says, six of the towns you give the Levites will be cities of refuge, to which person who has killed someone may flee. In addition, give them 42 other towns. So if you kill someone, you may flee to one of the cities. See, when, when we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is really really crystal clear on the punishment of murder. In Exodus chapter 21, if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. And you might think about it and say, man, that is so archaic. Well, it is. But is it fair? Is it fair? It is very hard to argue that it is not fair. I mean, even today, there are capital punishments in countries, and people and the court and judges assist to understand the intentionality behind the taking of life, and it can reduce, uh, uh, go into a death sentence as well. So that's how it worked, uh, and somehow some of it works right now as well. But then in Numbers, uh, when they talk about, it, uh, about murder, they say, if anyone with malice aforethought, shoves another or throws something at them intentionally so that they die, or if out of enmity, one person hits another with their fist so that the other dies, that person is to be put to death. So that person would be a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when they meet. So by now, the first question you have is, who are the Avengers? You know, what is this Avenger that is talking about in the Bible? Uh, it's saying in case of murder, you have to call upon the Avengers. Uh, I'm very 100% certain that the Avenger of blood doesn't look this cool. Uh, they are actually often a family member of the victim or someone engaged by the family member, and they are tasked to avenge or get even by putting the murderer to death. And this is based on the principle of a fair justice system that anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are free. They are to flee to a place I will designate. But if anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from my altar and put to death. So the avenger is simply the one who executes and, and bring out this justice uh, to the offender. Yet there will be situations where accidents do happen, and that's why they are called 
accidents. Uh, and, and Exodus says, however, if it is not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are free to flee to a place I will designate. And in Numbers, it goes on to say, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. They will be places of refuge from the avenger, so that anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial before the assembly. So we're kind of having, a, we're kind of having this glimpse, this glimpse of this justice system when it comes to murder in that time. And because the purposes of these cities, um, God has positioned them in such a way that you can get to a city um, around a day of travel. Uh, and the roads are meant to be kept well maintained, and, uh, and, that you can, and there's clear signs that says uh, Maklat, which means refuge. And yeah, so from, from the, uh, how the original justice system is set up, we can also see God's nature. And, um, and, and who he is. And just coming back to what it says in Numbers, you know, these places will be places of refuge from the avenger so that accused, anyone accused of murder may not die before they stand trial before the assembly. And from that, we can actually see who God is, his nature and his characteristic. One of them being God is gracious. God is gracious. See, by his grace, he first provided a place of refuge. When God was telling them the law and how things are to be done, he already had in mind, give a place of refuge. And this is gracious because grace is giving what someone doesn't deserve. And having a way provided to, for them to go to refuge and making sure it is accessible, available, and is, above and, is, is actually above and beyond what God had to provide because these people had nonetheless taken a life, whether intentional or not. So by God's grace, he already provided a place for them, uh, for refuge, for shelter. So God is gracious uh, when we look at the cities of refuge. God is also merciful. He gave the benefit of doubt to anyone accused of murder. Don't know whether it's intentional or not, but anyone accused of murder, they can go there. God has given them the benefit of doubt through the justice system so they have a place to go and to stay alive to receive proper trial. You know, as grace is giving something what someone doesn't deserve, mercy is not giving someone something they do deserve. And God is not quick to punish, even if it's a, a crime of taking a life as well. He is merciful. Yet, in God's mercy, He is still just. See, the cities of refuge were to provide a temporary shelter before the trial. And if during the trial, the person is proven by two or more witnesses to have murdered the person with intention, deliberate, with malice thought, they will not be able to stay in the cities of refuge and they will be you know, taken out. And then they are at the mercies of the victim's family or of the avenger. See, God is just and his way is just as well. In his grace to forgive, he is also righteous. And when it's proven to be an accident, the accused must stay at the cities of refuge until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the accused ever goes outside the limits of the city of refuge the, and the avengers of blood finds them outside of the city, then they can kill them without being guilty of murder. Right? The accused must stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. Only after the death of the high priest may they return to their own property. See, God is righteous. He is gracious to forgive, but he is righteous. Accident or not, this is a taking of a life. And taking of a life requires punishment in a righteous God's eye. And the punishment here is to live away from their community, from their families and friends, from their inheritance, until the one who had authority over their act has passed away. Because it was, it is still a crime that has been committed and the righteous God will have to do something about that as well. See, God is gracious and merciful. We say that all the time. We love it. 
Yes, and always that is true. But what is also true always is that he is just and he is righteous. That is also his characteristics. And as Christians, as church, you know, we need to be able to hold all these characteristics of God in balance, not having one blown over proportion than the other because God is all that, 100% all of the time. Before we get into it, you know, let, let's talk about the Avenger. Not the movie, but, but what we're talking about. You know, why would God allow the method of avenging be in the law? Why, why would God allow that? Is God, is God encouraging us to kind of, you know, take matters into our own hand? You know, harm is done, we do back to them. Is, is that kind of the principle that God is actually suggesting that we are to do, take matters to our own hands like this? What I want to say is about avenging is that avenging is no doubt um, a way to do things. But avenging is not the way, nor is it the best way. And it's actually not God's preferred way for us either. I'll use a, a New Testament example to explain that. So when Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, when Jesus was with uh, the Pharisees and things, it says in the Bible, Pharisees came to test him. And they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? So that's their test. That's their question. So Jesus replied to them and said, haven't you read that the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So with their question, Jesus first brings up, this is how God intended marriage to be. So then they continue and say, and ask Jesus, why then did Moses command a man to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Why is this allowed to happen? That's a very good question. You know, if God is intending this, why is this allowed? So Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. So Jesus is saying there's a way we're allowed to do things humanly, but it's not the intention of God, though it continues to exist together. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So what it is saying is imperfect and limited human beings would not be able to ever live up to the absolute standards of God. God has an intention. God has his will of how things work. God has a standard. But human beings with our limitation, it is not practical or realistic we can live up to that. And this is why God allowed more realistic and practical laws for the hard-hearted people. And when, talk, when it comes to uh, what we talk about, about avenging, if you have been hurt, if you had been wrong in your life, if whatever happened to you caused you pain and suffering. You know, Jesus taught us is that instead of an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand, a foot for a teeth for a tooth for a tooth, he said, turn, turn the other cheek. That's how God intended things to be. There is a way of God and there is a way that is allowed for human because of our limitations. He is saying, instead of hating your enemies, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus is showing us that there is a higher righteousness that God always intended for his children, for his people to live by. This is how Jesus taught in Matthew 5, because this way is what reflects the father that they have. As the children, this is who the father is, and this is how we are to live. So there's two ways. There's a God's way, a complete, absolute way, intention of God, but there's a way that is God allowed that is practically more achievable uh, by human beings. Uh, in Romans, in fact, it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. See, what 
what the topic of avenging is to ha- remind us actually to trust God, to submit to His timing of things, to live life His way. There you can avenge, but leave the avenging to God. Leave the punishments to the laws that's established by the government God allowed to be in power. Instead, focus on loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you. But then coming back to the cities of refuge, as we have read actually from both uh, uh, Exodus, Numbers, and Joshua, uh, you, we, because of the, just how it's come across in different books, you can see that God is very serious and very clear about setting up the cities of refuge. He wants everyone to understand He is merciful and gracious. He is just and righteous. And even though there may be numerous ways a person can commit uh, unintentional manslaughter, there's numerous ways, and there's numerous reasons to be running from those circumstances. What the Bible is showing us is there's only one place they need to remember. It is the place that they need to run to. The place that they need to run to. And that this is a place that is neutral. It is enforced by great authority to serve its purpose. You know, kind of like the continental, really. Um, well, uh, up until John Wick chapter 2, which he just goes in and, you know, does this thing. Because we all know there's no running away from John Wick, not even the continental. And uh, I know I may be stretching my examples here to prove that I did do my film study this week. But there really, there are far more serious situations than killing of life. That running to as strong a place as the cities of refuge cannot save you. What do I mean? See, the cities of refuge were set up for violation of physical laws. It is set up for violation of physical laws. So what if the violation is of a spiritual nature? See, all of us had violated God's standards. Physically, in our actions, you know, we've lied. Some of us cheated in different ways. I've cheated in exams. I tried to let my friends copy my answers. You know, we manipulate sometimes. We extort others emotionally for our gains at times. You know, we, we have intentionally or unintentionally caused pain to other people because it is easier than experiencing pain ourselves. We have in many ways lived in selfish and the self-centered worldviews. And spiritually, the Bible calls these sins. And there are sins in our lives and we are all sinners. And what that means as sinful people, as sins we committed, these are violation to God's holiness and God's glory. And Romans is that, you know, for all have fallen short of God's glory. You know, we have sinned. And we have sinned. We have fallen short of the standard of God, the intention of God that He intended for His creation. Ones like us who are created in His image to reflect His image. You see, when we don't live to, in the way of God, when we don't live in God's way, we live in sin. And these violations is punishable not just with physical death, but a spiritual death. That deep down in our spirit, there is a separation and isolation from the very presence of God. And when we never come to know Jesus and give our life to Him, receive the salvation from Him, we die in this condition, we will be forever separated from God's presence. So you're just looking at the nature of God. You see, a just God means the violation, this violation, the violation of sin needs to be punished. A righteous God means this situation has to be made right. Somehow, a punishment has to be served because an act of crime has been committed in spirit. But then a merciful God means that He is withholding the punishment that is on us. 
A gracious God means that He is providing a way. And this is where we arrive at a loving God, a God who is love. You see, when there is a violation that cannot be tolerated, one that must be punished, yet not wanting to see us go through this wrath in His love, Jesus came and He died on the cross and He took the punishment. God came in love to satisfy this wrath of God that needs to be made right, that needs to be punished because He is just, because He is righteous. But in His mercy and grace, in His love, He came to fulfill all that needed to be fulfilled. And He became the vessel of God's grace and mercy. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? See, Jesus took our place so we can find refuge in Him. And the reason number one why we should run to Jesus is because He is the only one who came to take a hit for you so that all that was required was fulfilled in His sacrificial love. And in His love that is sacrificial, we also find love that is secure. In His love that sacrificed, Jesus became the refuge for all of us sinners, a refuge from condemnation, as the psalmist said in Psalm 34. The Lord will rescue, speaking into the future, the Lord will rescue His service. No one who takes refuge in Him will ever be condemned. When Jesus took the punishment, He became the refuge for us. But it is also a refuge from the one who will continue to condemn us. Speaking of the devil, you see, the devil will always use lies, find ways to hold your sins and your shames above you, to make you feel condemned and to make you lose sight for what Jesus has already accomplished. It is true in the word already. If you're in Him, if you take refuge in Him, you will not be condemned. No one can do it, not even the devil as much and as hard as he tries. You see, in Jesus, you're sheltered from all that, not only because there's no basis to condemn because he's taken the punishment, but also because there are no basis to condemn because the devil has no power to condemn. Not just that no one can, but that in Jesus' resurrection, he actually disarmed the devil. He actually was victorious and he made devil the public spectacle. And devil was put on in shame. He was the one in shame. And he tries to project that on to you by holding your shame above you. But he cannot do it because he has no power to. No one can do that to you. And that's the number two reason why we run to Jesus. Because God had already avenged for us. Jesus is the ultimate avenger. And he had defeated the destroyer of souls in this world. And we run to Jesus because there is no one, nowhere more secure than being found in Christ. It is more secure than your wealth that you try to accumulate even as of right now. It is more secure than the image that you attempt to create for yourself, whether on social media platforms, whether among your friends or colleagues or your family. It is more secure than that. It is more secure than the wall you built up against the world. You know, Jack was saying how he was going through to different things in the video, you know, going to cooking, going to uh, music, going to different things. Uh, there is no, way, no place, no one more secure than Jesus, and He will never fail. He is our refuge. You know, this is instant refuge. You know, the Bible says if you believe right now, if you confess, if you cry out to God and save me, you will be saved. It doesn't need a one-day travel or anything. Instantaneously, it is done. See, church, standing here with all of you preaching right now and for all of you online, 
I, I, I don't care what you're running from today. Maybe exaggeration, I do care. But I don't care because whether it is of your own doing, whether it is other people's doing, whatever it is going on, we will always have more, million more reasons to run away from something, from someone, and keep running. We can always find reasons to just keep running away from what makes us feel uncomfortable. The situation at home, the situation with our friend, our courses, our studies, our career, whatever is bogging us, whatever is weighing us down, there's always reasons to run from all that. There's always reasons to keep running. So in a way, no, I don't care what you're running away from. But what I do care is where you're running to. Because there will always be something we have to run away from or feel compelled to run away from. But where are you running to that is secure against all that? Where are you running to? Because so often we turn to our might. We turn to our our ways, our strategies, trying to find a way to, to bend the truth and to do that, to, to push that friend out. And we, we come to ourselves. We, we rely on our, on our wealth, on our network, on our relationship. And those may be secure for certain cases, but they are not secure. And you find yourself going one place to another, to another, and another. You will always be running from these places because they are not secure enough. And when you move to the next one, you start living once again in this false sense of security and comfort that, you know, I'm going to be all right. You know, you might end up being like that rich, bad dude who killed the puppy. He goes to daddy's office. He goes to daddy's bar. He goes to daddy's safe house. It doesn't work. It's not strong enough. And guys, we, we have our heavenly daddy. And He has already provided the most secure refuge. It's in Christ who has taken the hit for you and He took out the one who's after you as well. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God has provided a way out for you. And you need not be overwhelmed by the temptations that's going on in your life, tempting you to run to anything but Jesus, tempting you to run away from everything around you. There is a way out, and that way is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And He will lead you securely back to your Heavenly Father. So why don't we just bring back to your context, to your life. This is what the Word of God is showing. What will you do about it? You know, today, if you think about what, what you're running away from, if you would have known how things would turn out, if you know how it would turn out right now and you go back again, would you have still done it the same way or allow it to happen to you in the same way? The reason I'm saying it is we can't really choose as well, you know, what catches our attention. You know, and I just can't, I feel like sometimes we're, we're just reacting because things will always happen. And when something happens, your attention is over there. When something else happens, your attention goes over there. And in our life, we're just reacting to what is happening and then we're running away from it. And your attention will always be caught by things that happens. That is true, and that is, that is what happens. But also, you can choose what you continue to give your attention to. Yes, something may happen that caught your attention, but now is your choice. Do I continue to allow my attention to stay there, or do I take hold of my attention and make a choice to turn to God? And I feel like some of you you, you, you really think of it in that way, that your attention can be controlled by you, that you're just responding and reacting. But there is a way, and the way is Jesus. And you have a choice. You have a choice each time to say, I see you. 
you just happened. There's no way I can't see you. I see you. But this is what I will choose to see. In Proverbs, it says, you know, like, uh, guard your heart uh, because, um, I can't remember it clearly right now, but guard your heart because everything in life flows from it. Guard what you think about, guard what you feel about, because in the Old Testament, heart often uh, links to mind and heart, not separated in the way we like to do it. Guard your heart above all else, because everything in life flows from it. Guard your attention, because what you put your attention to, it fuels your thinking. What you put your attention to, it stirs your emotion. Yes, when things happen, you will look to it. Acknowledge that and say, now this is my choice, and I choose to look to God, my refuge that is in Christ. And I'm thinking about, you know, 9-11. You know, when, when, when the plane run into, maybe some of you getting a bit too young to remember that. I remember watching from the TV. It was like those big TV square box, not the flat screen TV. You know, Zili just like, what are those? And um, I, was, I remember watching this. And I could, I, could, I could imagine, you know, when the collapse happened, it would catch everyone's attention. I mean, how often do you see buildings like that collapse in the middle of the day? Everyone's attention is caught. Imagine you're in that space. You're watching from there. You saw the, empire, you saw the Twin Tower come down. In that moment, what would you do? In that moment, you know, what, what, what would you do? You know, some, some was just overwhelmed by the situation because it was overwhelming. They, they stayed in that, their attention is in what had just happened. Overwhelmed, paralyzed, froze. There are also some that took control of their attention and instead of being allowed to be caught by what is happening, they controlled it and say, what should I look at? And they saw the people in need. They saw what needed to be done and they responded and did something about it. You have the control. You have the fruit of the Spirit. The last one that we always forget, tag along, self-control. You can control where you give your attention to. And let's stop running from millions and billions of things we can run from. Let's focus on where we're running to. And let it be Jesus. Let it be the God who is gracious, merciful, just, righteous, and loving. And let us come to Jesus to receive all that. Why don't we just bow our head? Let's just take this time for the Spirit to minister to many of you. You know, at times like this, things will pop up, you know. Running away from something is a vivid imagery. And many of you, you know what you're running away from. I don't want to, I don't want to diminish what that is. I want to magnify who Jesus is. I want you to remember that God is not saying, I don't care about your problems. I don't care about, that's not who God is. He cares about you, what you're going through, where you are. But He wants you to care about Him. He wants you to see just how big He is. He wants you to see that He can. He is the God who silenced the storm. He is the God who raised people from dead. He is the God that by His word, the Roman centurion slave was healed. He is all powerful. Don't let your problem overpower the all-powerful God that is in your life. Don't give your attention to what you're running away from. Give your attention to the one you need to be running to. Just church, I just want to invite you to acknowledge what you're running away from. And now I want you to acknowledge who God is and His truth. Heavenly Father, you are our great great father you are loving powerful and you are above all and i just want to commit all of us into your hands lord we need you we need to we're just crying out to you we need to believe in miracles do happen lord and we just want to say god do your will 
And we just want to submit to your will so that your will may be done because your will is good, pleasing, and perfect. These are all in your words. And church, we need to immerse ourselves in the word of God so that when time comes, it is available for us to act and interact with the world that we live in. So God, I just want to commit your children to you. They are your children. I want you to capture their attention. Just may your glory just fill this place. May your presence fill this place. May your peace fill this place right now. And just calm hearts. Bring up joy. Because you are here. And you're powerful. For some of you, I feel like the word is idol. That you have made what you're running from, the idol of your life. That you have to visit it every day. Remind yourself that it is there. It is time to remove the idol of your life and just acknowledge, you know, it is there, but God is my God and He will be my God over all this so that you submit all things to Him and may your life please Him as well. So Lord, this is our prayer. Thank you for being here. Thank you for encountering us. And thank you for your presence. And we lift all this to you because you can. Because you care because you are love. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us from now on and forevermore. Amen.